Hello, how are you? So welcome back to the channel. Uh, if you are new, my name is Dr. Facundo Gonzalez, an emergency physician, and I am three months away from becoming an attending, meaning I finished my residency. So I think I am qualified to react to this video. First of all, I want to thank Dr. David Jubal for allowing me to use the video and also he even commented that he's looking forward to it. So if you are watching, thank you and I hope you like it. I'll put the proof of his message here. So uh, I finished, I just finished a critical care emergency shift. It was hard and yes, this is what I do after my shift. I actually do enjoy making videos and that's it. So I'm gonna react real time to this. So you wanna be an emergency physician video. I actually never watched it before. I was saving it for this occasion, so I'm looking forward to it. So let's react to the video, okay? I'm excited to see what it is. So you want to be an emergency medicine doctor. You like the idea of high pressure, adrenaline, and saving people's lives. Let's debunk the public perception myths of what it means to be an emergency medicine doctor and give it to you straight. This is the reality of emergency medicine. Dr. Jabal, MedSchoolInsiders.com Welcome to our next installment in So You Want To Be. Emergency, emergency medicine, medicine is a specialty concerned with treating patients who are acutely ill with urgent healthcare needs. This can be treating acute conditions like a myocardial infarction or heart attack, or treating exacerbations of chronic health conditions, stabilizing patients involved in trauma, and more. Because EM doctors treat acute conditions from every field of medicine, they have to know a little bit about everything, but don't dive deep in any one specific domain. Think of them as the jack of all trades, master of none. If you're having a heart attack and don't have a cardiologist nearby, then seeing an EM doc is the next best thing. As my emergency medicine colleague says, if you ever have a medical problem, we are the second best doctor. Generally speaking, the job of the EM doctor is to stabilize the patient and then refer them to the specialist in the appropriate field. For example, if a patient- Okay, so I can, I can stop it uh, right now, at least for this section. And that is true. They always say that uh, master of none, jack of all traits. So yes, we are the specialist of emergencies in every single organ system, so exactly. So I do think we are the master of emergencies actually. So we are very good, again, at taking care of cardiac problem, uh, we can take care of it. Nephrology, renal problem, we can take care of it. Psychiatric problem, we can take care of it. Trauma, we can take care of it. So yes, we can stabilize any kind of problem. That's why I do like emergency medicine. You are well-rounded. When there's an accident in the road, where do they go? The emergency room. When your neighbor gets sick, where do they go? The emergency room. So again, like they said, if you can get to your primary or cardiologist, you go to the ER. We are always there available 24-7. Patient comes, comes in with, with multiple fractures after a motorcycle crash, crash. they'll stabilize the patient's airway, breathing, and hemodynamics, meaning their blood pressure and circulation. After that, they'll call the orthopedic surgeons to assess the extremity fractures and the plastic surgeons to address the facial trauma. By the way, that's an actual case from when I was in plastic surgery residency. The practice of emergency medicine is largely a function of location. What type of hospital do you work at? At an academic center, you'll be at the cutting edge of research, equipped with the latest and greatest in medical technology, therapies, and resources. In terms of salary, you won't get paid as well as a community or private practice doctor, but you'll have better benefits and job security. You'll have protected time to pursue research, and you'll enjoy paying it forward by mentoring and teaching medical students and residents. If you're at a level one trauma center, you may expect to see more complex cases compared to other settings. All right, so now he's gonna go into community, but that is 100% true. I am, again, at a teaching institution. I am a resident. We are a level one trauma center for pediatrics, for adults, burn center, transplant center, stroke, cardiac center, name it. So yes, we have the latest technologies. We have MRI, CT scans, perfusion, all this stuff. We do have a lot of teaching. We have conferences attendings do have protected time to perform their other stuff like research teaching simulation uh, critical care emergency medicine so yes and on average yes you do get paid less at an academic center but again if you 
like teaching, you want to have residents around, then some people are willing to take the pay cut and enjoy teaching versus working in a community where you're by yourself a lot of the time, not as many resources, but you do make more money. So I think he's going to go into community now. So that's 100% true, okay? As a community emergency medicine doctor, expect to do everything. At a larger community hospital, there will be more specialists for support, but at smaller community hospitals in more rural settings, there's less support and a larger scope of practice. You'll be treating more on your own, but you'll also be transferring more complicated patients to other facilities that are better equipped. Lastly, urgent- So yeah, quickly, uh, community medicine. Again, I'm interviewing for different jobs. And I, they told me there is no ortho, you are orthopedic, so I will be the orthopedics. Uh, I will be the mainly the physician stabilizing trauma patients. And then they told me, oh, uh, when you have uh, strokes, you actually send them out. If you have different cardiac problems, you can send them out because you have a cath center in another hospital. So again, but you'll be doing a lot of the work and you might send people to different hospitals for their condition care is unique in that you're working at a standalone facility, generally without a hospital or other specialties for backup. You'll be handling lower acuity cases with the option to transfer patients to the emergency department for sicker patients. This is a less stressful environment and is considered a good option for doctors wanting to ease a bit toward the end of their careers. For many non-surgical specialties- Yes, so 100% agree. Urgent care is more like a freestanding ED. Urgent care, like you see them around you, urgent MD, express MD, CDMD, etc. So lower acuity, meaning that too sick, you may get sick patients and then you have to contact your local hospital and send them out or refer them to the emergency room. But yes, I remember when I was working as an EMT many years ago, uh, an older doctor told me, do what you think you can do later on in life when you're 50. So he said, you could be a surgeon in school at 3 a.m. in the morning when you're 20 years old, etc., 30 years old. But it's not the same doing surgery at 4 a.m. in the morning when you're 50. So that's something to consider. And he used to work as an urgent care emergency doctor. So he once told me that. So that's true. Towards the end of your career, you might want to just work in the urgent care and not having to do trauma cases. Non-surgical specialties, you first do three so years of you first do residency, three years of internal medicine residency, and then subspecialize into gastroenterology or cardiology or, or, or another special disease or another specialty through fellowship. Another specialty emergency, through medicine emergency medicine is different as it has, its, different own as it has its own residency training. Emergency medicine residencies are either three or four years in duration. Some experts in the field say that four-year training programs are optimal as it provides better preparation, an opportunity to further develop personal maturity, improve in patient interactions, and have greater self-confidence. Additionally, it provides more time to explore and pursue areas of interest, such as those related to research. On the other hand, three-year programs have distinct advantages, such as spending one less year in training and earning an attending salary one year sooner. Plus, most graduates say they are satisfied with their training and don't feel they are lacking in preparation. On average, more academic institutions with research incorporated into the training will have four-year programs, whereas more community-focused institutions without a research focus will have three-year programs. Given the highly diverse and varied nature of emergency medicine, it makes sense for the residency curriculum to also be highly diverse and varied. Most of your time will be spent on emergency medicine rotations, but there's also rotations on trauma, orthopedics, ultrasound, critical care, anesthesia, pediatric ICU, obstetrics, and more. Emergency medicine... So, yeah, so I guess, yeah, I'll come in quickly on that. My training is three years. Again, you are making an extra years of attending salary, which is a big deal, especially in cases like myself, I have a lot of loans, so I'd rather start working sooner than later and start paying off some loans. Uh, yes, if you did an extra f year, a fourth year, I can see why you would be more confident, but I feel just like they said, three years is just enough to feel confident and the preparation is adequate. And again, you're saving yourself a good amount of money by not doing an extra year but again just so you know this is my input if you want to go into academics a lot of times they prefer the fourth year training since if you go to teach at an academic center that has a three-year program you finishing a three-year program is basically you're at the same level as the students the residents so they want you to have a four years of training or you could do three years and then do a fellowship before you can teach academic emergency medicine, just so you know. 
And he mentioned quickly, yes, we rotate critical care, anesthesia, pediatric ICU, everything. And to be honest, I do have videos on all of those. I'll put maybe at the end, but I have cardiac ICU videos, pediatric ICU videos, etc. Pave the way in residency admissions with the standardized letter of evaluation or slow. Applying to residency is similar to applying to medical school in that you fill out your primary application with your personal statement, but also submit letters of recommendation. The slow is a way to standardize the letter of recommendation. Rather than a gushing letter saying how great you are, the letter writer must answer a standardized set of questions, such as the nature of how they know the student, the student's commitment to medicine, how they compare to their peers, and more. This makes it much easier to quantify, standardize, and compare letters of recommendation. This will likely become more commonplace amongst other specialties as step one transitions to pass fail. The residency interview process is more laid back than most other specialties, which is reflective of the specialty being less formal than most. Rather than grilling you on standardized questions, EM interviews are more about the beer test, meaning having a casual conversation and deciding whether this is someone you'd enjoy having a couple beers with after a shift. The stereotypical EM applicant is the student who loved everything in medical school, who couldn't sit still, and always needed to be active and doing something. They're the ones that want to know a little bit about a lot of things, rather than a lot about a few things. Some would even say ADD, easily distracted, and always on the go. These are often the athletic, outdoorsy, and adventurous types who enjoy camping, running, and rock climbing. As with other fields in medicine, you can subspecialize with fellowship after- Yes, yeah, so that is true. Uh, again, it's not a stereotype, that is true, unfortunately. Yes, we're all hyperactive, we like the stressful environment. Uh, yes, the interviews are more about, can I work with this person? Simple as that. Again, you are all smart enough that you made it to the interview. That's it, you're done. You're smart enough, you're here. Now is whether I can work with you because I'm gonna be with you in a stress, on a stressful environment for 10, 11 hours, 12, 13, 24 hour shift overnight. So you need to know, can I work with this person? Simple as that. And yes, a lot of people go to beers after work. And yes, a lot of them do rock climbing, boating, like name, name it. Uh, so again, that is true. That's why when you see Dr. Glockenflacken, the funny doctor, he always describes the ER doctor as bicycle, rock climbing, etc. I have a video I reacted to on that also. I'll put it up there. But yes, that's very true, honestly completing your residency. One of the most popular EM fellowships, sports medicine is concerned with non-operative treatment of musculoskeletal injuries, pre-participation evaluations, and management of acute and chronic medical conditions of athletes. If you want to do operative treatment, you'd want to check out orthopedic surgery with a sports medicine fellowship, which we covered in a previous video. Wilderness medicine is focused on meeting the unique challenges of emergencies in austere environments. This includes tropical and travel medicine, hypothermia, altitude-related illnesses, envenomation, and other animal-related injuries. Ultrasound is being pushed heavily in the ED for its non-invasive diagnostic strengths. Fellows specializing in ultrasound also get to explore novel and future uses of the technology. Toxicology focuses on the treatment of drug overdoses and withdrawals, envenomation, chemical exposures, and toxic ingestions. If you want to work in the pediatric emergency department, you'll complete a PEDS fellowship after completing your emergency medicine residency. Hyperbaric medicine focuses on using hyperbaric chambers and hyperbaric oxygen therapies for certain conditions, and also includes the medical aspects of deep sea diving. EMS, often combined with disaster medicine, focuses on pre-hospital care. This translates to ground or air transportation and responding to or managing larger disasters. There is a lot to love about emergency medicine. In terms of life... Exactly. So I, there's not much I can say. He, re, he did an amazing job covering a lot of the most popular subspecialties, which we have all of them. Again, uh, co-residents are going to toxicology, which is usually two years, ultrasound, one to two years, critical care. EMS, uh, they have international medicine, which kind of goes hand in hand with tropical medicine, sometimes wilderness medicine. So again, 100% uh, true. I just want to add that sometimes, unfortunately, you may do this extra training and fellowships and not necessarily make more money. It's just you're a better applicant. You can work in academic centers. You can teach, maybe make a little extra money by doing an ultrasound director job. But... A lot of these things, you do them because you like it, you want to. Toxicology, you, you might be able to work as a consultant in the department 
toxicology case and make an extra money or decrease the number of shifts you have to work, etc. But it's good. Style, some love it, others hate it. On average, EM doctors work around 40 hours per week, which usually translates to three to four shifts every seven days, meaning you have several days off. This is shift work, meaning you clock in and clock out, and don't take work home with you, which isn't something you can say about most other specialties in medicine. It's a double-edged sword though. That also means you'll be working irregular hours depending on your shifts, whether during the day or at night, so a regular circadian rhythm is hard to come by. Also, it's not uncommon to miss important family events or holidays, which may actually be a good thing. Compensation amongst emergency medicine doctors- Exactly, you're 100%. Uh, even older doctors, you have to sometimes do your fair share of night shifts. And yes, again, 24-7, the emergency room is open on New Year's, holidays, birthday party, etc. It's, we're always open, we're always here for you. Okay, it's just how it is. It's is highly, highly variable, variable based, based upon the region and type of hospital, hospital you're practicing at. We, we found the highest salary of $395 per hour in New Mexico and the lowest of $130 per hour in New York. The average EM doctor makes roughly $350,000 per year. Which, again, I am so thankful that, you know, if that the potential of income that I will have. And yeah, it's crazy. You actually make very decent money with only three years of training. Uh, so it's a good specialty if you are considering. If you're watching this video for that reason, then it's a good specialty. EM is also unique in that sometimes it's more of an eat what you kill compensation structure, meaning the more patients you see and more hours you work, the higher your compensation. There's a great deal of team dynamics at play. Exactly, that's just what he mentioned there quickly. It's called RBU-based work, where you are return value units or something like that, which yes, you're compensated. You have a job that pays you, let's say, $135 an hour base, but then you have RBUs on top of that, productivity-based payment. If you see these many patients per hour, if you perform these certain procedures, not because you want to, let's say the patient does need a laceration repair, and the laceration is complex, it's seven centimeters long, you have to clean it, copious saline pressure used to clean the wound, then you actually get pay more because that was a more complex use of your time. So that is true, okay? play in emergency medicine as you're constantly working with nurses, techs, and doctors of other specialties. There's a large degree of social interaction at play, not only between healthcare professionals, but you'll be having a large amount of face time with patients and their families as well. You'll constantly be on your toes the entire shift without much downtime or breaks between patients. 100%, true. Some love the fast pace, whereas others wish they could get more than just a couple minutes to scarf down a snack. EM can also be incredibly inciting with a large amount of uncertainty. You won't know what types of patients are coming in or when they'll be coming in. You have to be ready for anything. 100% true. medicine is not without its drawbacks. Unfortunately, a large number of patients abuse the emergency department, which can prove to be a large source of frustration. This is not a discussion about why the ED is abused, social issues, political issues, or what changes should be made to curtail this, but rather what you will be experiencing as a physician working there. My EM colleague who helped me in the creation of this video mentioned a patient coming in for dry cracked lips during the current pandemic. No, that is not a joke. You'll also have illegal immigrants or uninsured patients using the ED as their source of primary care rather than for urgent medical conditions. Homeless patients may feign medical conditions to secure a roof over their head or food for the night. Those addicted to narcotics visit the emergency department exhibiting drug-seeking behavior to secure painkillers, which has become an increasingly common issue given the opioid epidemic. These situations aren't necessarily the patient's fault, but as an emergency medicine physician, the emergency department serving as a safety net becomes a source of frustration. Dealing with highly agitated or intoxicated patients also means that EM doctors are at higher risk of physical harm from their patients compared to most other specialties. For these and other reasons, e Yes, so I think now he's going to talk about burnout, but that's 100% true. Again, you will have your chronic drug seeker patient, your alcoholic, your drunks, your violent patients brought in by police. You will have to treat the person who literally stabbed their girlfriend or boyfriend on the news last night. Uh, you're going to have to deal with all those things. Yes, they get agitated. You always have these code M's or code muscle where you need to get security because they're going to throw things at you uh so yeah that happens i mean of course so yes you have those patients but i don't mind the part where a lot of people just is their only source of health insurance i don't mind it 
again, somehow the hospital is going to get paid. But in my case, I like being there for people when they're most in need. So if they come because they're illegal, they don't have insurance, or they come because they're homeless and they want food, I'm actually okay treating that and giving them food, letting them sleep in the hallway on a stretcher. I don't mind that at all. I mean, it's okay. That's helping others. So I like it. EM doctors experience some of the highest rates of burnout. Some contributing factors include working on the front lines, consistent high intensity and stress, unpredictability, increasing time required for charting at the expense of patient interaction, and irregular circadian rhythm. There's also a fear of litigation looming over your head given the higher rates of malpractice claims compared to the average physician. You won't be seeing exciting stuff nonstop either. The bread and butter, meaning the most common things you'll be seeing day to day, often include chest pain, abdominal pain, and headaches. 100%. The standard workup can become monotonous, and the treatments are not always definitive. Lastly, you may get some heat from other specialists who are quick to forget that EM doctors must go an inch deep but a mile wide, whereas most other specialists go a mile deep but an inch wide. You won't know the nuance of every condition because your job is simply to handle urgent cases, stabilize, and hand off to the specialists when appropriate. For this reason, some specialists will get frustrated at you for not managing cases to the same degree of nuance that to them may seem obvious. How can you decide if emergency medicine- Yes, 100% that's true. Again, uh, most of our consultants are very nice, but that's true. We're not going to do this full workup that an internal medicine doctor would do in nephrology, cardiology. We actually do a good amount and in a short amount of time. Exactly. So our productivity level, we accomplish so much in in so little time, which is still impressive. So sometimes they forget that. It's a good field for you. If you thrive in fast paced, sometimes chaotic and unpredictable environments, it may be a good fit. You shouldn't mind working an entire shift with nonstop action, even if it's not always the most exciting action. You may be forced to practice intermittent fasting, more specifically time restricted feeding, as you won't. That's a hundred percent true. I haven't eaten in 10 hours. Now because I'm doing intermittent fasting, which may help, just because that's just how it is. You have much downtime on your shifts. You'll work hard when you're at work, but you'll get to completely unplug when you're off. 100% No pager, true. no following up on patients or taking home call. You should enjoy the reward of saving lives, as emergency medicine is one of the few specialties that truly do. <laughs> you won't always be thanked though, as patients are in the scariest and most stressful moments of their lives. You also shouldn't shy away from procedures. You'll be doing more than most other medical specialties, although true. obviously not as much as surgeons. These procedures are wide ranging, including incision and drainage of abscesses, lumbar punctures, paracentesis, thoracentesis, suturing lacerations, reducing fractures, and even thoracotomies and chest tubes. Yes, yeah, so 100% uh, agree. You do a lot of procedures again, you and you save lives, which is crazy. I literally can say that today, my critical care emergency shift, I saved at least three lives, like literally saved a life, which is crazy. And I get, and I feel it's an honor and I get happy, like literally save people that w otherwise would have died of respiratory failure or would have died of sepsis, meaning systemic infection leading to hypotension, etc. And it's, it's very rewarding. And you do a lot of procedures, again, chest tubes, intubation, lacerations, repair, etc. So again, uh, I hope you liked this reaction video. I gave you my insight. Hopefully it's not too long, but again, I can't make it shorter. It's just what I think. It's a good discussion, reaction, and I never watched this video before, so I'm happy. So one take more of your time. If you're new, subscribe, like, whatever you do, share the video. And if you have any questions, comments, put them down below. I will answer. And that's it. Thank you for watching. Ciao.